Welcome to Defenders, the teaching class of Dr. William Lane Craig. Today, The Existence of God, Part 26. For more information or resources, go to reasonablefaith.org. We've been talking about arguments for the existence of God, and I've suggested that there are a number of good arguments that make it probable that God, in fact, does exist. We looked at the contingency argument, the Kalam cosmological argument, the teleological argument, the moral argument, the ontological argument. But I want to say something more now about a question that was asked last week where someone said, well, what about a person who doesn't have any arguments for God's existence? How does he know that God exists? Can you know that God exists? Is it rational to believe in God wholly in the absence of any arguments? And I think that it is, and this brings us to the subject of belief in God as properly basic. Belief in God as properly basic. And on your outline, you'll see a three-step argument uh, outlined. One is that beliefs which are appropriately grounded may be rationally accepted as basic beliefs, not grounded on argument. So what we're talking about here is a knowledge of God that is not based on argument. Rather, it's belief in God as a properly basic belief. Now, what do we mean by properly basic? Well, the idea here is that you can know that God exists without making an inference to God's existence from something more basic. This is not an argument from religious experience to the existence of God. That would still be an argument. Rather, the idea here is that belief in God can be part of your foundation of your system of beliefs, and it is grounded in experience. But it's not an inference from experience. It's not an argument for God from religious experience. And when you read the Bible, this is the way people in the Bible knew God. God, for them, wasn't something that you needed to prove by the existence of argument. He was a real person in their lives. John Hick, a well-known philosopher of religion, puts it this way, and I quote, God was known to them as a dynamic will interacting with their own wills, a sheer given reality, as inescapably to be reckoned with as life-giving sunshine or destructive storm. They did not think of God as an inferred entity, but as an experienced reality. To them, God was not an idea adopted by the mind or the conclusion of a syllogism, but an experiential reality which gave significance to their lives." End quote. Now, philosophers call beliefs like this that are part of a system's, uh, a person's foundations of knowledge, a properly basic belief. These are beliefs which are not based upon some other beliefs. They're not inferred from those other beliefs. Rather, they're part of the very foundation of your system of beliefs. Other examples of properly basic beliefs would include things like belief in the reality of the external world around you and the physical objects in it. Belief in the reality of the past, that the world was not created just five minutes ago with built-in appearances of age, um, or the presence of other minds besides yourself. Now, when you think about it, beliefs like this can't be proven on the basis of some other more foundational belief. Rather, these are part of your very foundations of your system of beliefs. How could you prove, for example, that you're not just a body lying in the matrix, wired up with electrodes, being stimulated to live in a sort of virtual reality, and think that you're here in this room listening to the Defenders class, where in fact you're actually just lying in the matrix with tubes and wires coming out of you? There's no way that you could prove that that was false. Or uh, imagine the belief that the world was not created five minutes ago. How could you prove that the world wasn't created five minutes ago with built-in 
memory traces in our brains from events that never happened, breakfasts in our stomachs from meals we never really ate, and all the other appearances of age. There's no way to disprove that sort of wild hypothesis. Or how could you prove that there are other minds besides yourself? How do you know that other people, or how could you prove, rather, that other people are not just soulless automatons that exhibit all of the external behavior of a person with a mind, but in fact they're just really robot-like androids with no interior life? There's no way to prove any of those beliefs. These are just uh, basic beliefs that are part of the foundations of our knowledge rather than beliefs that you try to prove from some more foundational belief. But although these beliefs are, pro are basic for us, that doesn't mean that these beliefs are arbitrary. And that's the second point on the outline. Although these beliefs are basic, that doesn't mean that they're arbitrary. Rather, these beliefs are grounded in the sense that they're formed in the context of certain experiences. For example, in the context of hearing and seeing and feeling things around me, I naturally form the belief that there are certain physical objects around me, which I'm uh, sensing. So although this may be a basic belief, which is not provable, nevertheless, it's not an arbitrary belief. It's grounded uh, in my experience so that it's perfectly rational to hold a belief like this unless you've got some overriding reason to think that you're deluded. Uh, that is to say, unless you have some sort of a defeater of this basic belief. And in the absence of such a defeater, you're perfectly rational to entertain these basic beliefs. Uh, you'd have to be crazy if you really thought that you were a body lying in the matrix and that everything around you is illusory, or if you thought that the world was created five minutes ago. So although these beliefs are basic, they're not arbitrary, rather they are properly basic because they are formed in the context of certain experiences. Now is there any comment or question that you have about this notion of properly basic beliefs. Do you understand the idea before we go on to apply this theologically? Just to your point, why isn't this an argument? Well, I am arguing that belief in God can be properly basic. So there is an argument here, but I'm not arguing that we should infer the existence of God from experience or from this argument. In other words, it, the, the, I'm giving an argument, but it's an argument for the position that it's rational to believe in God without argument. I thought you said in the beginning that this was for a person that didn't have an argument. Or... Right, for a person who doesn't have any arguments for God's existence. I'm giving an argument that that person can believe in God in a properly basic way, grounded in his experience of God, as we'll see, in the same way that you and I believe in the reality of the external world or the reality of the past. So I'm not giving an argument for the reality of the past or for the external world, but I'm saying I'm giving an argument for why it's rational to believe those things without arguments. Yes, Steve. Do you think God was alluding to this when he answered Moses when he said, what's my name? Uh, expound on that, Steve. What do you mean? Uh, when he said, I am that I am. And so just the fact that we exist is foundational to God's existence in our, yeah. and it also relates to our childship. Well, I don't know. I, as you'll see in a moment, I am going to argue that the biblical view of the knowledge of God is that it's properly basic. Whether or not that would be a proof text I would appeal to, I'm not sure. I, it, it did seem that Moses had a sort of experience there that was self-authenticating, that when you come face to face with God in that way, you know it's God, and there's no mistaking about that it would be properly basic for Moses to believe that. But that isn't a text that I had thought of appealing to. In fact, we might be in a matrix if we were to say, take that as a premise. If, in fact, we might be in a matrix, who's controlling the matrix? Right, we, we don't know. <laughs> we, we wouldn't know. I, this isn't an argument that there is no reality. Okay.
Uh, here's another popular example that philosophers often use. Maybe you're a brain in a vat of chemicals wired up with electrodes and some mad scientist is stimulating you to believe that you're here in the defenders class and going to JFBC. Well, obviously, that doesn't imply that there is no reality outside your brain. There is the mad scientist, the laboratory, the electrodes. All of that is real and exists. But you wouldn't know about it, and the people around you here that you see, and indeed your own hands and your head, are all illusions that the mad scientist is creating in you. And there isn't any way to disprove that kind of hypothesis. What you can simply say is the belief that I have a head is a properly basic belief, and in the absence of some defeater for that belief, I'm perfectly rational to go on believing it. Indeed, I think I know that I have a head. <laughs> Tom agrees too. He thinks so too. <laughs> okay, any other comments? Bill, my question is another process that people can go through who don't have an argument would be like Pascal's wager where you think the evidence is equally balanced, yes. and nevertheless you choose to believe in God yes. because the benefits seem to outweigh the benefits if you reject. Could you comment on that as another alternative yes. for a person without an argument? Yes, this is a very good point that George is making. What George is talking about there is not belief in God as properly basic, but he's talking about belief in God in terms of practical reasoning not theoretical reasoning. Pascal and certain other philosophers have argued that if you're in a situation where the evidence is equal, 50-50 that God exists, you can have practical reasons for believing in God that would make it justifiable to believe in him. For example, Pascal's view is that if you believe in God and you're right, then you have infinite gain, eternal life. On the other hand, if you believe in God and you're wrong, well, you've lost nothing or you've lost very little. Maybe you've uh, given up the pleasures of sin for a season, but not much. On the other hand, if you don't believe in God and he exists, then you have suffered infinite loss uh, because you'll be separated from him forever. And if you don't believe in him and he doesn't exist, well, you've gained the pleasures of sin for a season, but that's finite in comparison with the infinite loss you might suffer. So, Pascal argues, you have infinity to gain by believing and infinity to lose by not believing, so practical reason dictates that you ought to believe. Now, Pascal's wager is, is the subject of a great deal of controversy and some very interesting things have been written about it. I talk about it in the book Philosophical Foundations for a Christian Worldview, which I wrote with J.P. Moreland. So, if you're interested in this justification for belief in God, take a look at the chapter in Philosophical Foundations for a Christian Worldview. The essential difference between this approach, this Pascalian approach, and properly basic belief in God is this. Pascal's approach would be that you can, be, you can be justified in believing in God in the absence of any warrant for it. That it's okay to believe something without warrant. The view that God, belief in God is properly basic says that you are warranted in believing in God, but you're warranted in believing in it not by an argument but in a properly basic way. So it's, it's very different. One is trying to say you can believe in God without any warrant at all by just gambling, as it were. The other way is to say that you are warranted in believing in God, but in a non- inferential way. You believe, you're warranted in believing in God in a properly basic way, just as your belief in the external world is warranted, or your belief in the reality of the past is warranted. Those aren't just gambles. You're warranted in believing those things. So that separates these two approaches as, as very, very different from each other. I'll say something more about the properly basic belief and, and fideism, or is this just by faith, uh, and how does warrant work here? But we'll say that later on. I think that was a Bruce over here, yes. These would both be existential then rather than objective uh, proofs. These would be existential proofs. Pascal yeah, I think this, I understand what yeah. you mean by saying that. They're not inferential. You don't say this, therefore, God exists. 
but it's more existential in the sense that you just have this belief in this context of this experience. So, yes, I, I think that would be a fair way to characterize it. So uh, would you be making the argument then that um, a belief based on sense data is more likely than, uh, say, a belief contrary to, you know, our senses? Is that well, what you're saying? Well, now, likelihood. I, I, you say it's basic, but, you know, say if something yeah. was contrary to our senses, would that be a basic, could that be uh, properly basic as well? Something contrary to, uh, you know, our you know, senses, you know, in reality? Well, it would depend on if you had some sort of experience that would, would ground that. I, I, obviously, sometimes our senses do mislead us, right? We see the stick in the jar of water and it looks bent, but we don't believe that because we have a defeater for that. We know by optics that the light is refracted when it goes through the water, so the stick looks bent. And so because of that defeater, that defeats that properly basic belief that the stick is bent. So these beliefs that are known in a properly basic way are not indubitable. They, they can be revised if there are defeaters for them. So sometimes you're quite right. We deny something that our senses tell us. We say it's a mirage or... Uh, it's, it's due to some other uh, aspect of our sensory experience that, that isn't the way reality is. But what we do say is that in the absence of a defeater, it's perfectly rational to go with what our senses tell us. Is that clear? Okay. So don't think of properly basic as meaning indubitable or unrevisable, because that's clearly not right. The idea is that in the absence of a defeater, you're justified in going with your experience uh, and what your experience tells you. All right, now, the second claim that I want to make is that belief in the God of the Bible uh, is appropriately grounded so that it can be a properly basic belief uh, on our part. And it seems to me that the fundamental way in which we as Christians know that God exists is not through argument. I think that arguments are sufficient to know that God exists, but they're not necessary. I want to suggest that the fundamental way in which we know that God exists is through the self-authenticating witness of the Holy Spirit. Now, what do I mean by the self-authenticating witness of the Holy Spirit? I mean that the experience of the Holy Spirit is veridical. That is to say, it is uh, an experience of a genuine reality. It, it tells us uh, something that is true about reality. It is unmistakable for the person who has it. For the person who has the witness of the Holy Spirit and attends to it, uh, he can't be mistaken in thinking that it is the Holy Spirit. Uh, that doesn't mean, however, that it's irresistible or indubitable. We can grieve the Holy Spirit through sin. We can repress the Holy Spirit uh, by refusing to allow him to fill us uh, so that we can resist the Holy Spirit. But for the person who attends to it and responds to it, the experience of the Holy Spirit is veridical and unmistakable. I also mean that such a person doesn't need to have supplementary arguments or evidences uh, in order to know and know with confidence that he is in fact experiencing the Spirit of God. You can have supplementary arguments, but you don't need them. I also mean that this experience doesn't function as a premise in an argument for God from religious experience. It's not as though you argue, I have this experience of the witness of the Holy Spirit, and the best explanation of this is that God exists. This is not an argument from religious experience. Rather, the idea here is that this is the immediate experience of God himself so that belief in God is formed in a properly basic way. I also mean that in certain contexts, the experience of the Holy Spirit will imply that we apprehend certain truths about God, like God loves me, or I am guilty before God, or God forgives me through Christ, or I am reconciled to God through Christ, or Christ lives within me, and so forth. In certain contexts, these beliefs will 
uh, be implied by the, um, or will be apprehended rather, by the witness of the Holy Spirit. And I mean that such an experience gives a person not only a, subject, a subjective uh, uh, assurance of Christianity's truth, it's not just that he feels confident, but rather that he actually knows that Christianity is true. He has an objective knowledge that God exists uh, and has revealed himself in Christ. And finally, I mean that arguments and evidence which are incompatible with these truths are simply overwhelmed by the experience of the Holy Spirit for the person who fully attends to it. Arguments and evidence that are incompatible with this, these truths are overwhelmed by the experience of the Holy Spirit for the person who attends to it. And it seems to me that the New Testament teaches that this is the way in which we know that God exists, that Christianity is true, of whether you're a believer or an unbeliever. Now, let me say that at first blush, this appeal to Scripture might appear circular or self-defeating, as if to say we should believe in the witness of the Holy Spirit because this is what Scripture teaches. Um, we should believe there's a self-authenticating witness of the Holy Spirit on the basis of this other thing, which would be self-defeating, it would seem. But insofar as we are all Christians here today, and this is an in-house discussion among people who do accept the authority of Scripture, I think it's entirely appropriate to look at what the Bible has to say about the way in which we know that God exists. Now, if we were talking with a non-Christian, obviously we wouldn't appeal to the Bible to justify this. We would simply share with that person, I do experience the witness of the Holy Spirit, uh, and he does give me assurance of these truths. But uh, among friends, so to speak, or among family, I think it's entirely appropriate to see what does the Bible teach about how we know that God exists, that Christianity is true, and I think we'll see that, uh, in fact, it does teach that we know the truth of the uh, great things of the gospel through the witness of the Holy Spirit. Now, is there any question about that before we begin to look at what the scriptures say about this? Wouldn't it be easier to prove the authority of the Bible through the basic knowledge of sense perception and causality and um, that you could, what, because Peter said we don't believe in myths, we, have, we report what we see and what we hear, and that the authority of the Bible can be proven, and therefore if you can prove the authority of the Bible, then you go from there, which to me is easier, and not just use it as my basic yeah. proper belief. Well, there's a number of things to say here. One is, even if that were easier, it would still be self-defeating because in that case, you wouldn't be believing in this in a properly basic way. You would be believing in it on the basis of Scripture. And yeah, but you're believing in it on the basis of truth, things that are historical, okay. things that happen. No, no, it, it, it's not an argument any more than my belief in the external world is an argument that's based on oh, sense experience. Okay. The idea is that this is a, a properly basic belief and it isn't an inference from anything. Now, now let me say something else about what you've said. I think that, this, that the view you expressed also has the disadvantage that it would rule out faith for anybody who didn't have the Bible. Somebody, say, who doesn't have it translated into his own language, and there are millions of people like that today. Or somebody who doesn't have literacy skills and so can't read the Bible. And I want to say that these persons aren't shut out from salvation because of their illiteracy or the lack of translations of the Bible into their languages. If they hear the gospel, preach to them by a shortwave radio, say, or by a friend or a missionary, I want to say that that person is rational in believing in the gospel even if he has no evidence whatsoever that the Bible is true and can't even read the Bible. 
I agree with that, but I, I thought you said that you really can't prove the authority of the Bible. Did, did I misunderstand that? I think you did misunderstand okay. that. Okay. What, because... I said was, what I said was that my appeal to the Bible here to help you see that this is the way in which we know God exists shouldn't be thought to be circular because right. we are Christians, we do believe that the Bible is true, and so it's totally appropriate for us to ask well, what does the Bible have to say about how we know God exists? But if my faith is based on 12 apostles and what they saw and what they heard. Now, that's just the intellectual part. Yeah. What does the scripture say? I'm going to talk about this later on, but I want you to look at 1 John chapter 5, where in verse 9, John is reflecting on the apostolic testimony to Jesus, and he talks about the witnesses to Christ, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. The water is probably Jesus' baptism, the blood is crucifixion. So these are the, the bookends of Jesus' earthly ministry. The Spirit, the water, and the blood, he says, are the, are the witnesses. And then in verse 9 he says, if we receive the testimony of men, the apostolic testimony that you were just talking about, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God, that he is born witness to his son. He's talking there about the witness of the spirit. Remember, there are three witnesses, the spirit, the water, and the blood. And he says, this is the testimony of God that he is born witness to his son. He who believes in the son of God has the witness, the testimony in himself. So I think that John is teaching here that as great as the apostolic testimony is, uh, and as, as credible as it is, it, it, is, it pales in comparison to the testimony of the Holy Spirit himself who lives within us and gives us testimony that, that this is true. So we shouldn't think of these as competing with each other, but I, I do think that, and I wasn't suggesting you did, but I, I do want to say that it seems to me biblically that in addition to historical evidences and testimony, there's this other thing called the witness of the Holy Spirit that is even greater and, and will apply to people who are illiterate, even mentally retarded, and couldn't understand an argument for God's existence. That person can believe rationally, too, because of the witness of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Okay, if, since uh, that wasn't on the mic, let me just repeat it. She said, certainly that's true that through the witness of the Holy Spirit, for someone without the Bible, we can come to a knowledge of the great truths of the gospel. But most of us live in contexts where we have heard of the Bible, we have heard the evidences for God's existence. And that certainly is, is true, I think, for those of us who have had the benefit of living in America. But we need to think globally, and we need to think historically. And when you think globally, the vast majority of the world's population doesn't have the intel not the intelligence, pardon me, they don't have the education, the library resources, or the leisure time to study arguments and evidence for God's existence, nor have most of the millions of people that have lived in the past who were largely illiterate and, and never had the opportunity to do this. So when we think globally and historically, there's got to be, there's got to be some way of knowing these things, I think, apart from apologetics, apart from argument and evidence. And we'll go into this in a lot more detail, but I think you can already see the interesting questions that this raises about how do we know the, the great truths of the gospel. But I think what brought to mind what you were saying is that when Christ left, he said he was going to send the Holy Spirit. And that really was what he was saying. He's imparting this to us so that we would know this is real, this has really happened, and that would be what we can carry indefinitely. Yeah. I think that's right, Cindy. And what John says here in 1 John 5 is almost an echo of what Jesus says in John 14 to 16 about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And we'll look at those passages then next time. So next time, we'll look at the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. And then we'll look at the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of the unbeliever. And I'll argue that in both cases, the way in which we should know that God exists is primarily through the witness of his Holy Spirit.
The copyright for the content of this recording is held by Dr. William Lane Craig. For more, go to reasonablefaith.org.